getting high. We're going to uh, call this evening's study session to order. Uh, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. The record will reflect that Council Member Rosansky is absent. Thank you. Uh, first item is clarification for items on the consent calendar. Mr. Selich. I have none. Mr. Hint. Just one on item number number nine with the hearing officer appointment. Uh, does Mr. Woolley live in the city of Newport Beach? I'm not sure, but I don't believe he does. We'll check. Could, we'll could we check? I would just like to know that. Right, absolutely, yeah. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Dick? Uh, none. Councilmember Gardner? Uh, Mr. Webb? None. Uh, I'll pull item five just to make some comments. There's no staff uh, work needed. Uh, the next item is the citywide speed survey update. I can hardly. Uh, well, does the, is there anyone here on the public who would like to have any item clarified that will be on the consent calendar at our regular meeting? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Bernie. Mr. Mayor, uh, Tony Bryan, our tr city traffic engineer, has a brief presentation for you. We'll try to keep it brief. Uh, Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. What we're bringing to you is basically a summary of where we are with updating the engineering and traffic survey for the city. This is essentially, and another way to put it, an update to the speed surveys and reviewing uh, posted speed limits throughout the city. So this is something that uh, we've started in the process of. The, uh, the need and the purpose of doing this this project and this study that we're doing is that we're required by state law to review the speed limits, the posted speed limits in the city every either five, seven, or ten years. And that's based on the roadway conditions and the uh, certification of the radar within the police department. So it can vary anywhere between five to ten years. And there have been some recent changes in state law that discuss uh, a manner in which you post the speed limits. So uh, that's also prompted us to review the posted speed limits in the city, and we'll get into that a little bit later as to what those changes are. As far as the police department having the ability to enforce the posted speed limits in the city, we need to and we're required to post those speed limits per this state criteria. So. If we don't post the speed limits per the criteria, it takes away the police department's ability to do corrective enforcement of speeds. Are you, does that mean that if a policeman is, is uh, enforcing a prima facie speed based on conditions and we have a, a really heavy rainy day and, and uh, the speed limit's 45 miles an hour, but it's prudent to go slower than that, that the police department can't give a ticket for, for somebody doing it uh, uh, slower? No, there's, there's always the basic speed law. And, right. and the basic speed law gives the police department some criteria in which they can determine if the driver's driving at a speed that's unsafe for the roadway conditions. And then they can make that determination as to whether they should cite that vehicle because the conditions are you know, rain or something else, they can make that. that uh, but it, it's much more difficult for the police department to do that process than to just look at a speed survey. That's correct. It's a judgment decision for the police department to, to enforce the basic speed law. Okay. When we've gone through the existing speed survey that we have in the city, there's approximately 34 streets in the city in which our current survey is either seven to 10 years old. So 
based on that, in addition to the changes in the state law, we are looking at having to update the speed survey for those streets. And we thought that as in addition to just looking at those streets, we'd look at the entire city and go ahead and do this update citywide so that uh, we can take care of the, in the excuse me, entire city at one time. As I mentioned before, the police department does need to have this updated speed survey for them to effectively enforce the posted speed limits and to really be able to do their job uh, effectively. And today we have, well, I had hoped that we would have an, a member of the police department to, to come up and speak about their uh, enforcement uh, needs, but We've had many discussions with the police department over the years, and essentially they've had issues where they've written citations. People have contested those citations. They've gone to Harbor Court to represent the city, and the judges look at the uh, contested citations. If the speed survey is not current uh, or updated, a lot of times the judges will uh, dismiss the citation. So the pol police department is really interested in getting this updated speed survey. Uh, I'd like to invite a, a consultant that we've hired to review these speed limits and to work that we've been working with on recommendations for posting the new speed limits. His name is Bill Zimmerman, and I'll invite Bill up to talk about speed limits. Thank you, Tony. Mayor and council members, the... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Good start. Setting speed limits is based on two criteria, two references we have. One is the California Vehicle Code, and the second is the California edition of the MUTCD. Combined, these two combined give us the basic criteria and methodology for setting speed limits. Speed limits are set at the 85th percentile, which means the speeds that 85% of the vehicles are driving at. And it Vehicles have a tendency to drive at reasonable and prudent speeds. And based on that information. Is that the bottom limit or can you go higher? Oh, I'm sorry, on the speed limits? Yeah. Um, yes, you can go higher. The, the bottom limit, bottom threshold is set by the criteria itself. Um, and I can jump to that very quickly to it. But it, the, um, the speed limit is based on accident history. It's based on safety and they, they determined over years of studying and doing an analytical analysis of this that comparing both the speed and the accident history that the 85th percentile is the more accurate uh, threshold for setting speed limits. But through the years we had a lot of, of different changes and 1996 was the major change where it allows us to set the speed limit at the nearest five, five miles per hour and then we had the opportunity to apply uh, engineering judgment to set and reduce the speed limits. 2006 was a turning point where they, we had to set it within the five miles per hour and then it set limits on how we can reduce the five miles per hour. And when we do reduce the, the um, speed limits by five miles per hour, it had to be documented in writing. Are, are you gonna cover those reasons? Uh, um, when we can reduce them or is that, do I ask that question now? Um, we can. Yeah, I think we're, what, what Bill's leading to is that <laughs> this process evol has evolved to a point where the state has slowly restricted what we can do. And I think maybe if you could walk, th walk us through what those requirements are in order to reduce from the state criteria right now. Right. The, um, the next slide actually, or the bottom one, 2006, the Caltrans policy directive, which was issued July 1st, 2009, actually set more of a policy and it gave us direction from an engineering perspective of what we can and cannot do in applying speed limits to certain areas. An example, we have to, we have a rounding that we have to now ad apply to all different types of uh, surveys. So with the 85th percentile that came at 43 miles per hour, we're now obligated by law to go to 45 miles per hour. If the survey 85th percentile came in at 42 miles per hour, then we had to reduce it down to 40 miles per hour. The, we used to be able to use items such as um, not apparent to the driver conditions. 
uh, which included uh, roadway curvatures, it included um, narrowing of the streets. And what we're finding out now that we only can apply these three items, basically areas of high accidents, uh, areas of high pedestrian travel and pedestrian travel or bicycle travel, and then other conditions um, that are not readily apparent. If a driver's driving down the street, he can see a curve in front of him. So that's an area that we used to use to come down five miles per hour. We're not allowed to use that anymore. So the thresholds have been tightened up. Uh, what this does for the agency itself and the police department is that it gives it tighter enforcement. It means when it goes to court that we have these criteria now opposed to uh, an engineering judgment which was be able to um, to look at and be able to find holes in it. Now we're set with this criteria saying this is where we got to be with it. You cannot, the leeway is pretty much gone is what I'm basically saying on this. Stopping sight distance um, on our major arterial. Like if you have a curve, mm -hmm. and yes, you can go into the curve, but uh, the person may not recognize and realize that they don't have sufficient distance to tie. I mean, to distance to stop. So that's what I'm talking about. Stopping sight distance. If you okay. have a really tight curve, like the S curves on Irvine Avenue. Well, it re refers back to the um, the vehicle code. 22350, where it comes back and says drivers will drive at a reasonable and prudent speed for the roadway. So even if there is no uh, very good, or if the sight distance is very limited, the driver will drive at that speed, and that's how the 85th percentile is looked at. So coming back to the answer is no, we can't take that into consideration again. So, so we are required to set a speed limit higher than the person can see a stopping sight distance for it? It is based purely on the 85th percentile of speeds that are driving. Yeah. When we say 85 percent, 85 percentile speeds, this what we're saying is that's the 85th percentile. That's what people are driving at today. I understand the okay. 85th percentile yeah. concept. Right. But, but yeah. what it does, I mean, <laughs> we start off with a 40 mile per hour zone, and most of us drive about five miles faster because that's just what we all do. And so when we do the 85th percentile test. Now it's a 45 mile per hour zone, which then means we're all gonna start driving 49 to 50 miles per hour. So when we do our next test, so where do we get to the stopping point besides having everything at 65 miles per hour or whatever? Well, I think coming back to Councilman Webb's question about looking at sight distance, we have looked at locations along roadways such as Irvine Avenue where there are numerous driveways. And if the driveways have limited sight distance, then we would look at that as a criteria that's not readily apparent to the motorist or someone that's unfamiliar with Irvine Avenue because they're driving along that roadway and they, you know, they're not necessarily apparent that people backing out of the driveways, their sight distance is limited. We've used that as a condition not readily apparent. So there, there are different uh, conditions that we can use to back up the uh, reduction of five miles per hour in the posted speed limit, but we do need to document those and very clearly document those conditions in the doc in the speed survey so that if it is contested there's substantiated uh, reasons for rounding down an additional five miles per hour but I think your question councilman well, I was just sort of a is, rhetorical thing about mm -hmm. it just doesn't right. seem but it, I'm wondering though given that whether we wouldn't be better off in certain circumstances saying, okay, you know what, we're not going to be able to get as many tickets on this stretch of the road, but if we keep it at 35, then we're going to have most people driving at 40, whereas if, and not ticket them if they go beyond what we think they should. But if we raise it to 40, oh, get, great, we get to ticket them, but they're now going 45 in an area. We may not really want them to go 45 because we know our community. So that, that's just, I think sometimes there may be a trade off where we just go, because the average person probably doesn't know this. Yeah, right. And I think what you're saying is that people will adjust their speeds on a roadway based on the posted speed limit. And I think the practice has been and, and the studies have shown that people will drive a, a speed on a roadway based on what is a comfortable speed to drive on that roadway. So whether you post it 40 on the side, 35, people will drive at the speeds that are you know, comfortable to them based on the conditions of the roadway. The width, is there parking on the roadway, uh, sight distance, if there's trees in the median, et cetera, et cetera. All these factors will p play into 
the speeds that people drive on the roadway, not so much that there's a sign on the side of the road that says 35. So that's part of the, the basic speed law, and that's definitely the background into how the, the state law is written to determine what the posted speed limit should be. Tony, uh, I know your office briefed most of the, I guess all of the council members about the changes in the map and what it represents. And I think you've heard from many of us uh, uh, raise issues of special circumstances for some of these streets. Does this map reflect any of that discussion or is that, are those findings yet to be made? No, what we're gonna present to you, the map and the proposals for the posted speed limits reflects all of the, you know, our ability to look at those streets and be able to reduce the mm -hmm. posted speed limits to the extent that we can with the conditions not readily apparent in the accident history. So all of those factors, curb cuts, driveways, blind spots, vegetation in the medians, all of that has been accounted for in the map that you're presenting? Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hamm? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so I understand the 85th percentile uh, concept here, but when is the, when is the measurements taken? What time of day? Usually we take them midweek and during the, the mid, mid uh, period of the day. It can Broad be daylight. morning. Broad daylight. You know, at, right, mid morning, mid afternoon. Um, it's so not, so we're not going to take them during the peak hours. And, and So they're, you know, taken, they're taken under ideal driving conditions under essentially. Daylight, yeah, right, correct. Yeah. Daytime hours. See, that's part of the, I realize we're not gonna change the state law sitting up here today, but that's part of the problem that I have with this because driving safety changes at night it's harder to see, and the older you get, it seems like the harder it is to see. But in any event, for everybody, it's harder to see at night than it is in daytime, especially pedestrians and other, you know, sudden change. Uh, and so that's, the, that's one of the fundamental problems that I have with this, that the measurement time is the most ideal time where people will be driving as fast as they reasonably believe they should drive. And that may not be the same as what they drive under less than ideal circumstances. But yet, the speed limit doesn't change whether it's daylight or dark, right? It's Correct. the same speed limit. Correct. So and that's, then, that's the difficulty, that, the fundamental difficulty I have with this whole approach. Right. Well, I, I think we also, I mean, I, ha I can see one area that's marked. I thought it was going to be changed, but it wasn't. Where I'm already, I mean, I have every, couple of months I get complaints about people, cars going too fast. I mean, they already think at the posted speed, it's dangerous, and now we're going to increase it by five miles per hour. Uh, we've got two top lots, Bayside Drive. Where is that, Drive. Council Member, Bayside? Yeah. Uh, we've got, because from this map, as I said, when we first discussed it, I thought that was going to be, uh, we were going to be able to consider that a special condition. Right. And, and We'll jump ahead a little bit here. I was going to just before you do, Tony. I, I wanted to make one point, and then could you jump back a slide? Yeah, don't jump the, ahead yet. I got some questions. The, okay. And no, one more slide too. It may may be obvious to everyone else, but the the three categories at the bottom. Do you have to have? Can you have one of those, or you have to have three of those? Just you one. can right as okay. long as so it's, they're all ors. And in a lot of cases, if you can show a high accident history that is sufficient to the courts to support the posted speed limit or a reduction in the in the five okay. miles per so hour. So the, the other thing then, and Councilmember Gardner especially, I one of the things that I think ties into your bicycle committee work is if we do become a more bicycle friendly city, I think that necessarily would allow speeds to go down. And I never you never quite think of those things together, but any, I'm, I know I'm showing my bias as a cyclist, but I think um, you're seeing communities up and down look at cycling thoroughfares as a way to start to bring speeds down too. Mr. Selich. Yeah, on the uh, different criteria, what's, uh, is there a number that you have to have for a high accident history? It, as long as you can show, there's no hard and fast number. Um, you, you just wanna show that it can depend on the types of accidents. So like 60 accidents in 30 months, is that high? There's, there's no magic number, if you will. I, it, if you're looking at a segment of the roadway and depending on the types of accidents, if, uh, you know, yeah. there's well, a I lot think, of injury I think, you know, accidents. We got issues on Bayside Drive, not only where Councilwoman Gardner's talking about, but down between uh, Marine Avenue and Coast Highway 
and I'd suggest you contact the homeowners association down there because I've got documentation on all the accidents. And we, if, we that, can, if that could be dropped down five miles an hour, it's also a high pedestrian bicyclist area. You've restriped the, the streets with the bike lanes out in the street now. So right. I think that might be an area that you want to take a look at. Yeah, sure, that's a major can, thoroughfare can, for the junior lifeguards going to. It is. Yeah, we can review the accident history again on that. Um, we tried to do that for each of these segments of the roadway, make that determination, but certainly we can review that uh, again. Tony, why don't you put the map back up there? Do you have a copy of the map that we can actually read the speeds that we're talking about? I, I can. I, totally illegible. I, I can certainly. I, I can certainly apply, you know, provide you with a, a larger map if you'd like or something that's more legible. It would be helpful uh, to know whether we're going. I can't. I have probably 95% of the speeds memorized, but I'm not sure I got 100%. Okay. Right. I, I can certainly provide uh, each council member with a larger map if uh, that's helpful. Put, put it up there, Tony, because most of the people who are watching at home really probably can't see it yet, but it's going to be in the newspaper, I expect, in the next couple of days. They're going to see it then. And they're going to have the reaction of looking at this and going, are these people out of their minds? I drive this street every day, and they're going to raise the speed limit. My kids go to school on the street. How can you possibly reasonably do that? And I know that because that's the same reaction that uh, Councilmember Selich and Councilmember Gardner and I had when we had a chance to be briefed on these and the arguments that we raised about what's going on in our own districts, about how it really didn't make a lot of sense to do this the way that state law says that we have to do it. And the point I want to make is this is the way state law says that we have to do it. And you can thank our friends in the California legislature. They've got a stellar record of, of common sense these days uh, of having to set speed laws. Because if we don't set them, we simply cannot have our police department enforce these laws because the lawyers that defend these cases realize that if the, if the, if a, if the speed limit's not properly set, the tickets will get thrown out. And ultimately, our police will not write tickets where they cannot be, in fact, they're not supposed to ethically write tickets where they cannot be uh, enforced. And that's the dilemma that we find ourselves in between trying to do what all of us, I think, and I think I speak for most of my colleagues, intuitively believe to be the right thing to keep our city safe on the streets and roads and, and to provide for a good flow of traffic, and yet to respond to the California legislature and the requirement that we must raise these speed limits in accordance with their predetermined formula. And I will tell you all that that's not a comfortable position to be in, nor do I believe it's a logical one, but yet it's the one that we find ourselves in today. Mayor, while he has a map up, I just want to make one comment. Um, what you have on Newport Center Drive, as I indicated in our meeting, just makes no sense to me whatsoever to take that circle and have two speed limits. I don't know what the speed limit is, but it's almost like we're creating a speed trap for people. Most people aren't going to know that halfway going around that circle that the speed changes. No, I, I agree, and it looks so odd. So we ought to have one speed limit, whatever it is around there. No, I, I agree, and it looks odd to, to split them, but... Uh there's, there's different reasons why the measurements might come out on one side lower than they do the other. At San Nicolas, there's a stop sign, for instance. So it, it doesn't intuitively look correct, but when we did the measurements over and over on that particular segment, it did show higher speeds on the, uh, the west side than it did on the east side. So, But I agree that I think that you should have a consistent speed limit around Newport Center Drive. So. But, Tony, are you saying it can't be done in light of that? We've really tried, right, we've really tried to look at this one. Okay. There's, a, there's a handful of streets on there that just jump out, and we've really tried to focus on those streets and say, what can we do to, to support a reduction of five miles an hour on the on the? Yeah, but if you gave me a we, ticket going around there, I'd go to court and call it a speed trap, and, you know, I bet you a lot of other people would. Right, and, well... And, and there's the there's the, um, the the issue of speed traps, and, and that that language is the actual language used in the vehicle code, and that that ties into why we we would need to update the the speed survey in the city, is so we don't have streets that fall under the legal definition of a speed trap. So I think you know I, I think the mayor hit the hit the nail on the head. This is a process that we have to deal with, and I, it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't here because. If we, if we make the speed limit consistent around the circle, then someone could attack it from the other approach as well. Um, you know, I think we can probably look at these a little closer and maybe, maybe look some more at the speed studies and see, you know, how far different is it. 
my guess is is because that side of the hill is is uh, the outside is a little less populated with driveways and activities. Um, so maybe we can maybe we can take another closer look at these areas and see how they work. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, a process that we're that we're kind of stuck with, and we don't want to create a situation that's inappropriate for the PD for enforcement purposes. And if we knowingly set a speed limit that's incorrect, we're probably going to be challenged on that at, at some point, just as well as if we didn't. So well, that's why I asked the question if if the. Uh, 85th percentile was the minimum. I can't mm -hmm. read this map, so I don't know what the speed limits are there, but it might be one situation where it makes sense to increase the speed limit. I can't see where it'd be. Right. I drive that circle mm -hmm. all the time. I can't see where it'd be more or less safe to go a different speed on one half of that circle or the mm -hmm. other, irrespective of what these speed surveys say. Right. It's just, it just defies logic. Yeah. It's, uh, you're, you're correct. Especially if the slower side has right. stop signs that'll limit the speed anyway. Correct, and that, yeah. that basically are, those are the conditions of the roadway, and that will determine what that measured 85th percentile speed is. And so one side of Newport Center Drive has different conditions than the other, and we've measured different 85th percent speeds, and you end up with this odd situation of a change in speed limit on one half mm -hmm. versus the other. But, uh, but well, isn't San Nicolas going to be signalized anyway? That's going to be signalized, so that stop sign's going. It, it's right. that, the, that'll change it's the speed the as well. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's I, sometimes it's how we pick the segments, and maybe we need to relook at how we pick this segment and and say that, you know, the circle is an entire segment, and look at that as a whole, and because it does make sense to make it one speed. Uh, and you're right when the when the signal goes in, and we're also planning another signal at uh, Anna Kappa, uh, that'll change things as well. So. And you know, this is kind of an evolving uh, issue. I'm yeah, sure. the conditions of the roadway, you know, are are evolving, and that's why when you look at posting the speed limits, and that's where you get that five-year, seven-year, ten-year mm -hmm. situation is if the conditions on the roadway change, such as putting a signal in, then you would have to come back and mm -hmm. readdress the speed limit uh, at the five-year period. But I think what you can do is when you look at this map, and when I, I'm able to give you a larger map you'll see that the, the roadways that we're talking about having five mile per hour increases on are, are basically primary arterial roadways in the city. We're not really looking at lesser collector type roadways for the most part. We're, we're looking at the Jamboree Road and MacArthur and uh, Bison and, and roadways up in the airport area and that's really the streets that, that you're seeing, we're proposing the, the five mile an hour increases. And, um, Dover Drive, um, again, it, it, we, we really tried hard during this process. If we could go back and measure it two, three, four times, we would do it. We really wanted to, to set the speed limits uh, to, the, to the best of our ability. And Did you do the measurement on Dover between Mariners and Irvine? Not that requested? Yeah, we, we split, we did combine that into one, one segment. Um, within four, is that Vista del Oro there? That's kind of. That's okay. correct. That's okay, correct. that's. I understand your points about the larger streets, high capacity in the airport business area. <clears throat> Excuse me, but Vista del Oro. I mean, with the high school there, that's already kind of a driver's ed training course. So to be increasing speeds there is is just. It's already unsafe. I mean, you know, I mean, you're talking about young people in high powered vehicles that already are struggling to, in some cases, maintain control. We. We really struggled with that street, and we did a number of speed surveys for that street because we we knew that there would be a concern looking at Vista Laurel because it, you're getting back into a residential area versus on a arterial roadway. So we really did focus on that one to the extent that we could, but again, it's based on the measurements of the speeds on the street and perhaps the tie-in to the the, the high school students and the speeds that they're driving may may play an impact on the speeds that we measured. But um, you know, ag again, we can focus on that street again. Perhaps break it into different segments, as Steve is talking about. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that. that. The other areas, I don't have a heightened awareness about. Maybe some of the others do in the council, but Vista Del Oro definitely. 
Well, well, and I think certainly uh, having people increase the speeds at which they approach each other at Spyglass Hill and San Miguel, where we've already had to put in a turn signal and, and we've had historical issues there with accidents because of the way that the road was, uh, the, the sight lines, you know, is uh, it certainly has to be a questionable uh, judgment. Uh, yeah, I think the message you're hearing, Tony, is uh, we want you to go back and take a look as much as we can at all of these in these circumstances that exist here to see what can be uh, adjusted given the, what we all sort of know intuitively and rationally to be the actual circumstances on the ground. And I appreciate that the, the state law prescribes a certain way of doing things, but the, you know, the state legislature hasn't got a particularly stellar record of making logical good government decisions, and uh, we unfortunately get saddled with them. And I think uh, once this map goes out and the people realize what's happening in their communities, uh, you're going to get a lot tougher questions than I guess you're getting from us today. Uh, but, but I know all of us share these same concerns about uh, what we perceive to be illogical and, and, uh, and frankly, unsound um, judgments. Right. Well, not I, to, I not to shoot the, the messenger, but okay. you're... No, it I've, seemed I've, to me that we could make the findings on Vista Del Oro. I mean, God, that's a residential street. There's no way that's uh, an arterial street going through there. Right. No, it's not an arterial. It's more of a collector or a commuter type street, so it's, uh, it doesn't fall under the prima facie of 25 that most residential streets would. But uh, I was just no. going to suggest, I, I, I've, I've heard you mention a number of streets here this afternoon, and we can certainly go back and take a look at those, those streets again before we bring this to the council. But my, my idea was is to, to come back to the council with an ordinance, citywide ordinance, where we would be able to adopt uh, speed limits and these speed limit proposed speed limit changes and then that will be brought back to the council for two hearings so that's that's my intent at this point but if you'd like to see it again certainly we can give you the larger map we can focus on the roadways that were brought up this afternoon the uh, one that I notice is is Violito over the bridge you're going to increase the speed limit over the bridge and then reduce it immediately on both sides of the bridge or is the speed limit the same as on Violito? Is it the same as westerly of the bridge as it is easterly of the bridge? I know it's 25 miles an hour on the island, isn't it's it? It's 25 miles an hour there today. On the mm -hmm. island? Mm -hmm. No, on Violito between, uh, okay, so between you're gonna, Newport you're gonna, and, and the bridge. It's 25 Okay, so you're going to go Violito through past the theater over here at 25. Right. Then right. you're going to increase it to 30 over the bridge, and then you're going to drop it down to... 25 back on the island I again. Think no, it's that's posted, not what the I think it's says. posted 25 all the way through, and I, I think it's that initial segment that going between Newport and the bridge that is the segment that, you know, it, it's posted 25 today, and we really it's supposed to go to, to 30. We really needed to focus on the speed. We on need that to get you a better map is the bottom line. Because so, yeah. so you're going to, you're going it, it, to, what you're saying is that starts at Newport Boulevard and mm -hmm. goes all the way over the bridge. No, it goes to the it, bridge. To the bridge. Stops the at the bridge. bridge. Oh, right. okay. And then once you get to In the commercial bridge, area, uh, I'd it'll like be 30 to make, miles an hour. I'd like to make a request, Mr. Mayor, um, because, uh, I mean, <laughs> we're sort of doing it piecemeal here, to do another session, another study session, before we get to the point of actually looking <laughs> at something as an ordinance. And with the bigger map, so that we can go over these issues, because I think there will be certain streets where we may just make a philosophical decision uh, that may fly in the face of... of tickets and things like that. I don't know. But rather than having you trying to answer with, without us having really good information, to give us a chance to go over the various um, streets and, and really in detail. So, Because we did have some of that, but uh, as I say, I thought there were going to be some changes before it came. And, 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 we, and we did look at it again, but certainly right. we, can, we can really scrub through the data a little bit more and, and see if there's any sec segments or it can be changed or we can break street road, you know, roadways up into different yeah. segments. But if you get us the, the big maps first, then perhaps we can all get back to you with our immediate concerns and then we could, is that all right to do another Definitely. session? I, if, if, we, if we exempt out some of the streets like Councilwoman Gardner suggested, does that invalidate the whole study or just those streets get invalidated? Uh, only those, those streets. streets. Only those streets. Can, can we also on that map show <laughs> where the speed studies were taken? They were okay. taken on... Well, I can give you a list well, of the segments, but well, they were like, taken on all throughout the city. Well, I know that, but like oh, the, the remiss, request that I had, no, 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 I'm talking about the actual location where the oh, speed the, study okay. occurred because I had requested that it be done 
okay. between Mariners and Irvine because I felt the speed limit in there was like a speeds in there was slightly lower than the other section. Right, right. And I look at at Vista del Oro, and if you were measuring the speed in one of those tight curves, I can guarantee you it's going to be a little bit less than on a straightaway. So maybe we need to uh, look at where we're measuring the speeds in addition to uh, what they are because uh, uh, we're stuck with some things. Maybe we need to creatively uh, uh, measure these speeds. Right. So the extent that we can go back and review the exact locations, I can talk to the people that collected the speeds, find out where they were. We can we can do that. Or, or maybe just find a creative way to not include Vista del Oro. It shouldn't be too difficult. <laughs> right. I, I, if the council but, wants to review Vista del Oro, they can certainly certainly yeah. do. That. I, I think we can certainly do that. We can certainly omit roadways, but uh, but. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate the police department isn't here because they, they're they the ones that are really have the strongest concerns about their ability to do enforcement. So yeah, I'm not sure um, why they're not here, but let's get in here. Let's, either, let's go back another round on this because I think the public wants to be heard on this too once they see the map. Okay. And, uh, we can do that. We, we, uh, it'll be important for you all to tell us exactly what the flexibility or parameters are to make adjustments such as suggested by Councilmember Selich so that we really know what we're dealing with here and making a decision. We can do that. Okay. Is so there any member of the public who would like to speak on this matter? Okay, seeing none. Uh, next item is the update on Harbor Patrol, Harbor Resources Coordination. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Chris Miller with the Harbor Resources uh, Division. And I'm here to introduce uh, Lieutenant Mark Long with the Heart Patrol, who is, um, well, earlier this summer, he gave a presentation to our Coastal Bay Water Quality uh, Committee, and he was asked to come and make a similar presentation here. And so I'd like to introduce him. And before I do that, I'd like to say that um, I've been really impressed working with uh, Lieutenant Long over the past year and a half. Um, he's taken his department in a different direction, a new and exciting direction, in my opinion. And uh, they work very closely with Harbor Resources, and, and I think he's going to tell us more about that right now. So, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. My name is uh, Lieutenant Mark Long with the Orange County Sheriff's Department. As Chris said, thank you for that introduction, Chris. Um, I did give a speech at the water quality meeting. Um, I don't exactly remember exactly what it was I talked about, so rather than try and regurgitate uh, what it was, what I wanted to do is kind of give you an overview of our approach to law enforcement and the Harbor Patrol since I've been here. And this ties in with our improved working relationships, in my opinion, with the city of Newport Beach. So um, when I started down here about 18 months ago, uh, my predecessor left in a bit of a hurry, so I didn't have an opportunity to really develop a plan. I, I, I don't think I, I knew what, what the problems were in the harbor. I, wasn't, I didn't have a firm grasp on everything that the Harbor Patrol did, um, what our relationships were, what our problems were, what our challenges were. Well, I've been here 18 months now, and I think I have a little bit better understanding. Um, and I have a, I've developed an overall view of what I think is uh, helpful to the city and helpful for the Sheriff's Department Harbor Patrol too. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship that we can both benefit from. So, And when you look at the harbor, I kind of envision it as a city within a city. Everything that a city has, the harbor has. You have residents, you have businesses that operate on the water, you have traffic control issues. You have HOA issues. You have accidents. You have speeding problems. You have BUIs. You have parking problems. You had code violations. You have noisy neighbors. Uh, you have crime. You have fires. You have rescues and you have drownings out there. So when I, when I look at how I can best serve the community and best serve the city of Newport Beach and the Sheriff's Department, I look at this the same way that uh, we police some of our contract law enforcement cities is how can we use the services that we have to provide the greatest service to the residents and, and to the community. So in my opinion, when you have crime, you take criminal approaches to it. There's been some 
some confusion as to who's gonna handle crime in the harbor in the past. Um, I, I've talked to uh, City Manager Dave Kiff and to the Chief of Police as to how best to handle crime in the harbor. Uh, in the city of Dana Point, which we also have a harbor, it's, it's very easy, this, the Sheriff's Department patrols the land side and they patrol the water side. Anything that occurs on the water, it's the harbor patrol. Anything that occurs on the land side, it's, it's the land side patrol. I think that model is very successful down there. I think it works very well up here in Newport Beach if we kind of adopt the same model. If we have crime, the Sheriff's Department could respond, on the water, the Sheriff's Department should respond to it and take action. If we have code enforcement problems, um, we can work with city code enforcement uh, or Chris Miller's office. If we have, um, say for instance, one of the operators in the harbor is operating a noisy vessel, uh, a party boat, a booze cruise as they like to say, uh, we can work to either get their license revoked or we can go out and write a ticket. Um, anything that occurs out there, if we could take action, I think it's, it's appropriate that we do so because we're very familiar with the water and it does, we're not requiring the city of Newport Beach Police Department to come out or anybody else in the city of Newport Beach using up your resources to do the very thing that we're capable and willing to do. So that overall approach, um, if, if there's a code enforcement problem, we could work with anybody in the city to help solve the problem. Um, so. I think when you look at it on an overview of, of that, if we could take action, I think it's appropriate that we do so. If we can't, we work with the city to help solve the problem. And that's kind of, in a nutshell, the overview. Um, part of this has encouraged dialogue with Harbor Resources. Um, in the past, we've had problems with the noisy boats. In the past, we've had problems with people operating without a license. Um, what this has done is it encourages us to work with Harbor Resources to help solve the problem by either revoking their charter, revoking their license, or giving them a ticket and confiscating the boats. So just a basic overview of our increased participation in the harbor and our increased cooperation with the city of Newport Beach. And I just wanted to run over kind of some of the accomplishments that we've done in the last 18 months. Um, we've managed to gain about a million dollars worth of Homeland Security grants for the Harbor Patrol. Uh, one of the things we're going to do with that money is we're going to buy a different type of boat for the Harbor Patrol. Uh, we've successfully negotiated a five-year mooring agreement with the city of Newport Beach. Um, when I first walked into the office, we served, I served on a committee from Supervisor Morlock's office that wanted to cut funding or disband the Sheriff's Harbor Patrol. Um, we successfully thwarted that effort. Uh, we create, or we uh, authored a report that, that stopped that, uh, that was presented to the Board of Supervisors in December. And then what happened is the Board of Supervisors ordered the performance audit and we're concluding the performance audit right now. And part of the performance audit is to look at whether the Harbor Patrol will continue to be funded out of parks budget. Um, we've developed a maritime unified command that operates out of Newport Harbor. What we do is, is that million dollars that we got from DHS, we started um, increased patrols along the coastline for Homeland Security purposes, working with the Coast Guard and Customs and Border Patrol. A couple of weeks ago, one of the boats washed up on Newport Beach's shorelines, and um, there's indication that there's increased landings both in, New are in Newport, Dana Point, Crystal Cove, um, Laguna Beach. Um, so all along the coastline, what's happening is, is you have increased land, as they slam down the border in San Diego, you're having increased landings in, you know, along the coastline. Um, We've written the MOU with the Naval Weapons Station in Seal Beach. We've identified different types of patrol vessels as I just talked about, and what we'll probably do is use that same vessel in the Harbor Patrol going forward. Um, we've completed a fee study of all the fees in Newport Harbor, including um, the short-term mooring fees, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, towing fees and the storage fees, and the slip rental fees. Um, once the slips get uh, built, these are to go to the Board of Supervisors probably in about six weeks. If they're approved, they'll become effective first of this year. 
Um, we've also completed a, a Newport Tsunami Disaster Preparedness Plan with the City of Newport Beach, and we've written the MOU, and it has yet to be approved by uh, the City of Newport Beach Police Department. So it's been a busy 18 months, and uh, in closing, just uh, I don't think close yet. You've left off a couple of things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, the, the, the turnabout has been so amazing. I hear it from all sorts of people, but I just know from my own experience. Uh, our derelict boat problem in Big Corona, your department was very helpful in working together with us to solve that. Um, the races, there was uh, the sailboat races, the big unnecessary controversy, and you came right in and really tried to, to resolve that. And I don't think that's com completely completed yet. Well, but, but I mean, at least there, there was suddenly there was a dialogue before it was more of a manifesto. And uh, for the, for the point of view of the Water Quality Committee, the, the fact that, that we have a DITAB program, that the Harbor Patrol is willing to get out there and help us with that so when visitors come, we can make sure that their boats are not contributing to any pollution of our waters. Th those are also things that you didn't mention but are very, very popular and wouldn't have happened under a previous regime. So we thank you very much for those. Well, thank you. Councilmember Dale. Uh, derelict boats within the harbor, um, it's my understanding there's been a little bit of swapping of jurisdiction. Can you kind of address what the new uh, program is, which I think our residents will find uh, more responsive, but how that's going to work? I'm not sure I understand okay. the question. It's, when we talked, it was my understanding that you're going to be doing more of the sort of the front lines on that and that you have a vendor in place to dispose of boats. <laughs> The derelict vessel problem is, is a little bit difficult because if you take a real at proactive approach to derelict vessels, you're stuck with the bill. We have to put those boats up for auction, which costs money. They typically don't sell. Then we have to dispose of them in a manner that's approved, uh, and it's very, very costly. So by taking a very proactive approach to derelict vessels, you're incurring a huge cost. Um, uh, we have a vendor that can destroy the boats for probably as cheap as you're going to get get them destroyed, but the cost is is high, and and we're we're trying to walk that fine line between running a bill up for the city of Newport Beach and dealing with the derelict vessels. I, I think you have to prioritize. You have to find the most egregious offenders of it. Um, and, and then you have to take a pro – you try and take every lesser course possible before you actually confiscate those boats and, and, and be stuck with them and the bill that's associated with getting rid of them. So more than, let's say, a year ago, though, your, your, um, your people are going to be more on that problem in the harbor? We could be <laughs> – we could be all over the problem. It's just how much are you willing to pay to get rid of the problem. Um, I think um, the the DITAB pro program that the DITAB program that uh, um, Councilwoman Gardner talked about uh, initially that's going to apply to transient boaters and the, those on liveaboards. Uh, eventually, you could check the di the uh, DITABs on those derelict vessels. Uh, but once again, you get into the point that, yeah, you have a violation of law. We could confiscate the boat. We could seize the boat. We can, um, but it's, it's a problem because it's very costly. Councilmember Hinton. Yeah, the question for the city manager. Um, <clears throat> of course, we're working on harbor fees too, including mooring fees. And um, the, I know the sheriff's represent, representatives have been sitting in on our meetings. Do we have a copy of the study that they've done on mooring fees and harbor fees? I think we do, and remember they were looking at short-term um, kind of a daily use fee, which used to be $5 and now went up to 20 It's not up no, yet. It hasn't uh, been approved. But it's headed to what? It's – we propose 15, 15 in the off-season, 25 in the peak season okay. per day. But it's still something worth looking at. But the county has longer-term moorings in the harbor, right? They assign those to us to administer. Yeah. Oh, they do. So the yeah. project we're working on, in effect, will cover those moorings. That yeah. That – that raises a good question, though, that if, if you – if a lieutenant doesn't mind answering it. What part of the derelict boat problem do you think is related to the fees we charge for mooring? Sorry, that was a really loaded question. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think actually Chris could handle that better than I can. Uh, I think that 
that it's inexpensive to park your boat in the harbor uh, on a mooring. Um, and consequently, there isn't a lot of incentive to get rid of that vessel, uh, even if it's not seaworthy. Um, I could go out and, quite frankly, prove that a lot of certain boats are not seaworthy in violation of the Mew Newport, Mun Newport Beach Municipal Code and then take action against those boats, but then I get back to you're stuck with a boat that you have to destroy or you're stuck with a person that may or may not take action, um, make it minimally seaworthy or not take action and then um, you're stuck with a boat that you have to get rid of at a high cost. Uh, Mark, I would just uh, echo Councilmember Gardner about the good job you've done in repairing relations between the county and the city. I think you've done an admirable job. It's uh, evident when you're traveling with you through the harbor or at the yacht clubs or what have you, uh, the respect people have for the county and the job you're doing, and I know we really appreciate it here as a city council. Thank so you, thank Mr. Thank you very much. Mr. Webb. You mentioned that you were getting new boats. Are they going to be about the same size as the ones you have today? Or yes, they, they are. Uh, okay. I would like to talk a little bit about those new boats because I'm pretty excited about it. Sure. The boats we have, we've, been, we've had in service for 25, 30 years. Um, they haven't changed their style. Uh, they are labor intensive. Uh, they're maintenance nightmares. Uh, they, re they have termites. Uh, they, have, uh, they need to be repainted often. We, we essentially take a pleasure craft and we convert it into a fire boat. Uh, we've had problems with those conversions, the weight distribution. Um, it, it, it just sometimes in emergency situations, uh, those boats don't handle the way they were designed to handle because of all the weight and equipment that we put on them aftermarket. You avoid the warranty. There's, there's all kinds of problems associated with it. For about, and by the way, when we take delivery of one of those boats, it spends anywhere from six to eight weeks in our shop getting painted, getting retrofitted with all the equipment getting tested, et cetera. The new boats are similar to they're the rigid hull inflatable boats, uh, similar to what the Coast Guard has, uh, similar to what uh, a lot of patrol agencies have up and down the coast. Uh, there's no painting. The, the uh, deck and the cabs are all aluminum. Uh, the maintenance consists of pulling the boat out of the water once a month and pressure washing it. Um, there's no termite problems. Uh, they're all outboard motors, which are more designed for um, saltwater use. Uh, they're easy to change out. Uh, it's, it's about the same cost, and for that cost, you get all state-of-the-art equipment, whereas now what we're doing is we're stripping all of our one boats and then putting the old equipment onto the new boat, and it doesn't always translate all that well. So um, to me, it's, uh, and most importantly, because uh, I know some of the residents complain, when we do run code, um, there's less displacement on the water on these new boats. It'll create less of a wake. So it was actually, and, and they're much, much quieter. So there's a lot of advantages to just patrolling around Newport Harbor as well. So it was, it was a, it was a no-brainer in my opinion. Thank you. Is there any further report on this? Just one more, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to add uh, your thanks to, uh, as well, uh, my own to Mark and um, to Sheriff Hutchins because I think we, um, she's very accessible. You've been very accessible when when we've had any questions, and we sure appreciate that. Um, I know Chris does as well. And then one one clarification of something I just said about the county moorings, uh, as as you'll recall from a couple months ago, the county harbor patrol administers our moorings. I think what the county did, at least with the county-owned moorings, was they just decided to set their rates at our rates. Is that right? Is that correct, Chris? For the long term? Yeah, for the long term. You, so you were that, correct the first time around. You, okay. You administer the moorings for the long term. We administer your moorings on the transit for the short terms. And the rates <laughs> in the new agreement, the rates that the county administers for the short term moorings also apply to Newport Beach's okay. moorings. Great. Thanks. Does that clarify that? I think so. Thank you. I just want to say one thing, too, is, is that I'm new here. I hadn't worked here as a deputy. I hadn't worked here as a sergeant. And um, I feel very welcomed by this community. I think they've, um, um, they've been very hospitable to me. I've gotten a lot of advice. I've uh, gotten a lot of direction uh, from both the council, from city staff. And um, 
I'm looking forward to our improved working relationships in, in the city. So thank you very much. Thank you. You, you don't work on a two-year term. <laughs> <laughs> two years on, a two years someplace else, I heard. You know what? Um, I tell you, I, I really like the sheriff. Uh, I think the sheriff is doing an outstanding job. I think the sheriff understands the importance of, of positions like this and that um, sometimes that wasn't always the case where people, the manner in which certain jobs were selected uh, weren't given the full weight of, of the position. So I think she, in our contract cities, in uh, positions like this one, in, um, in some of the other areas where uh, um, we have a lot of community feedback and community relationships. It's important to pick the, the people that could help develop those relationships. The, the sheriff understands the importance of that. Um, so, uh, so if we think you're doing a good job, <laughs> let's talk to the sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just if I'm, um, yeah, if I'm not doing a good job, please talk to the sheriff. Um, so, um, and anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any member of the public who'd like to speak on this matter? Please come forward. All right. Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, item four, uh, the Balboa Village Parking Management Program. So, Mr. Mayor and council members, this is an item that um, has been long in the works um, and involves uh, primarily on the, uh, on the peninsula, the Balboa Village Parking Management Program, but I think there are aspects of it that affect other areas of town just by precedent and study, and um, Lee DeSantis is going to present that. At the conclusion of the presentation, we have a uh, kind of a checklist format that, because we are seeking some direction on this one from you. So with no further ado. Good evening and, and thank you. Um, as the city manager mentioned, I've been working with Walker Parking Management Consultants for quite some time now looking at where the city might improve parking in and around the various commercial villages. And last year we brought Walker's recommendations to a study session uh, and received direction from the council on how to create a program to implement those recommendations. In the process of doing that, we came across a number of issues relating to both the municipal code and the draft program that we believe council should review and provide direction concerning before we return with the final program. And the first such issue is in the Municipal Code, Chapter 12.44025, which creates the off-street parking facilities fund. Um, if that provision allows for 50% of the gross meter fees collected in on-street parking meters can be deposited in the off-street parking fund. And although the language indicates that the fund should be spent in the geographic area from which it originates, the code does not define, quote, general vicinity of parking meters contributing to the fund and there are no requirements for separate funds or accounting. The city practice has been to deposit all funds into one fund, accumulate enough money for a project, and then to use the money from the different geographic areas to complete that project. Um, as we've been drafting amendments to this, um, we've been anticipating the creation of several very specific geographic funds, one of which is Balboa Village, another would be um, Corona Del Mar, and perhaps Mariner's Mile. And so the question that came before us is, as we're amending this language, should we establish only off-street parking facilities funds for specific geographic areas, or shall we continue to provide for the use of the off-street parking facility fund anywhere in the city? And there are persuasive arguments on both sides, whether it should be geo or uh, anywhere as well. And these are influenced perhaps by the second issue that we'd want to discuss with you. So the question that we're seeking direction on is should the city establish off-street parking facility funds for clearly defined geographic areas only or provide for a facility fund that could be used anywhere in the city? The second issue is should parking revenues not specifically designated for special funds such as off-street parking, neighborhood enhancement, or the tide lens be deposited? Um, the code doesn't clearly establish the general fund as the default location for these monies and talks instead about recreational areas whose funds should be deposited in the general fund. Um, the code currently lists nine specific zones and of those zones only one is called out as being designated a recreational area and depositing in the general fund. 
In truth, the administrative services has broken down parking meters and parking lots into 43 different zones, and 31 of them are being deposited into the general fund at this time. Seven are divided between the general fund and off-street parking or neighborhood enhancement, and five are going specifically to Tidelands. Since there's no record of to who declared the zones recreational or what the definition of recreational is, staff is suggesting that as we ad address the code to establish the parking management district, we also look at this section and take out the issues regarding recreational area and add language that says that the default location for parking revenues is the city's general fund. And so this is the question that we're going to be addressing. As we get more to the specific, I've provided a map at which I expect you only to see the dotted line outlining the parking management district rather than try and read either the legend or any of the other markings which are far too small. Um, but within this proposed parking district, there are 865 metered off-street spaces in six public lots, 66 metered on-street spaces and 214 unmetered on-street spaces. Six, four of the six public lots belong to Tidelands and for the administrative purposes, for the operation of the district, we'd like to include them in it, but their revenues will continue to deposit in Tidelands. And the purpose of the district, the proposed um, district will meet these criteria. One, the program would meter the 214 unmetered parking spaces. Um, we're doing this because according to all of the parking experts, on-street parking is the premier parking that everyone wants first and right now it's free and the metered parking and where we want long-term people is, is pay. Um, we're not using this resource to the most effective manner. People will circle and drive through town um, looking for a free street space rather than if they're going to be here going to the lots. So by metering these spaces there are a lot of congestion and air quality and parking issues we can um, correct. Um, we're also talking about establishing seasonal and market parking rates. Um, we talked with Shoop and the fact there are different times of the year when parking has more value and the use of it is in higher demand and we need to try and create some turnover and vacancy and market seasonal rates are one way of doing that. We want to establish a Balboa Village Parking Facilities Fund from which the revenues of all the meters within this district except for Tidelands, will go to that fund and be available to continue to improve parking within the area and procure more off-street parking. And we'd like to establish a specific Belboa Village Neighborhood Enhancement Reserve that would be used for other um, neighborhood enhancements that would return the money into the area from which it's come for projects that are important to that community. And lastly, we want to talk about a a potential residential parking program, which was their final um, component. Um, of these, one of the things we want to talk that we need clearance on as we were developing those programs is the period during which meters would operate. Currently, they operate from 8 to 6. We are proposing they operate from 7 to 7. Um, the Bebelo Pier parking lot opens at 7 in the morning. Its closing times are later. Um, police enforcement starts at 7 in the morning, um, so both police and the um, parking lot crew support starting the meters at 7. Um, at the same time, um, it came up, and we'll discuss it more later as we talk about residential parking. Um, the parking district includes some areas which could be characterized as a bit more residential than commercial because there's overlap between the two and should there be some meters in the residential streets that start later and end earlier. And we'll go back to that subject. Um, so we will be coming to ask you about ours specifically. Okay, seasonal rights were one of the biggest areas discussed under um, the Walker study and through SHOOP and throughout. And Walker's advice was that we probably ought to have in our villages three, four tiers of parking, um, particularly in this area where it's heavily impacted by beachgoers. Tier one would be peak summer weekends. And we're talking Friday, Saturday, and Sunday um, from about late May to early September. 
a total of 17 peak weekends, 51 days during the year. The second tier would be non-peak weekends. That would be all the rest of the weekends, 105 days annually. The third tier would be weekdays, whether it's summer or winter. And then we also dis have a distinction for holidays, of which we recognize three, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day, where there are special impacts. Um, at the time Walker did their study, um, we had the parking rates that were um, equivalent to Tier 3, and they chose, in looking at their study, to use our base rates at the time in 2008 as the weekday rate. And so it was a dollar an hour, six dollars a day. And then they just thought that for non-peak weekends, parking um, at the meters on the street was, should be worth 50 cents more, and that parking on the peak weekends at the meters on the street should be worth a dollar more than the weekday rates. And so that's how they structured the schedule they proposed. Since then, the city has changed its base parking rates They'd been the same for a decade or so, and so in April they were raised. And now Tier 3, which is our standard rate, is $1.50 an hour. And so looking at, well, with $1.50 an hour, the new base rate, what would the Tier 2 and Tier 1 rates would be? Well, $0.50 cents more would be $2 an hour, and $1 more would be two fifty an hour. Um, the difference in the Walker meter rates versus the parking lot rates, the daily rates, um, they were 80% of if you parked on the, at the meter all day. So 12 hours at the meter, 80% of that was what they suggested as the day right. Um, so using a very similar formula, the extrapolating the day rates would bring in $15, which is what it's currently set at. Holiday rate is set at 25 and suggesting that Tier 2 would be $20 and Tier 1 would be $25. Now to get a wrong number, those come up at 83% rather than just 80, so it's a bit higher. And frankly, it felt a little too high, and I realized feeling is very subjective, but in, so is economics, and we don't quite yet know what the elasticity of parking demand is and what we could actually expect to get without turning people away. And so we have proposed a reduced daily rate um, the hourly rates would be 152 and 250, but the daily rates would be the 15, 18, and 20, with the holiday rate at 25. And somehow um, that just seems to me um, more likely to bring in greater revenue. People will still be coming rather than the $25 daily weekend rate, where we might lose lose people. Lee, uh, just can we just make sure we clarify what exactly are what is today's rates for those various categories? Today's rate is $1.50 an hour, $15 a day, plus $25 a day on holidays. Okay. So it's basically tier three of meters and daily. That, that's what we changed, went to. That's what we, we went to. we changed rates before. So this is correct. This is our current rate. This is our current rate. This is our current rate. Yeah. Okay. And the rates that are being proposed up above that are being based off of the current rate, just as when Walker did rates two years ago, they based off this cur then current rate and went upwards. Okay. So, but on the daily, when it goes up, it's a very subjective, um, those seemed high, and so we've provided two alternatives. The straight 83% ratio, which this is, or this is, 83, that's 75, and that's 80. And the, the intent of Walker's original uh, recommendations here was to find the, the parking rate that would generate at least a 15% vacancy factor for on-street parking, yes. even though we can't just keep testing and changing and testing and right. changing. The idea here is let's start it there and see what happens, and then reserve the right to make further adjustments up or right. down. Depending and in on fact, they suggest that once rates are changed, that in I don't know, nine months to a year, one should revisit it with a study to see what kind of impacts they've had, since you just each place is different. I got this question yesterday: Are there going to be any exemptions for small business owners or employees? How are they going to be treated? 
right? Um, so these are our questions that we were just discussing, and we'll come back to them about market rate, um, seasonal, and, and reduced daily. And the next question is exceptions. And so we are proposing one exception, and that exception would be for the um, excursion boats, whaling and fishing, and the Catalina Flyer. Those businesses have over the years been directed um, to send their customers to the Balboa Pier parking lot. And those businesses over the years have been of the opinion that they have a slight market um, disincentive um, as regards their nearest competitors in, in Dana Point and Long Beach. Um, Long Beach actually charges $14 a day to park, and Dana Point doesn't charge at all. Um, with our new rate of $15 a day, it puts us at a dollar above Long Beach and, of course, 15 above Dana Point. And so they've been concerned, and through the bid, they've been approaching us about a validation program. What I'm suggesting in this draft program is that we allow the users of the excursion boats and the Catalina Flyer to pay the $15 a day rate even on weekends, whether it's non-peak or peak weekends. Um, beyond that, they've talked a little bit with administrative services and the business have been told that they could potentially buy that down further if they wished, but that administrative services um, was at this point taking the position that the $15 a day um, minimum should be paid. And but there's so other businesses a, there than Catalina right, Flyer and... Um, right. And the kinds of meters that we're talking about installing are pay by space meters rather than head at every spot in the community. That pay by space meter, you park, you go to it, you, you estimate how long you're going to be there and you pay in advance. So the discussions that I had with the Balboa Village bid was that in many respects, if you were a business who wanted to subsidize your customer's parking, you, it would probably work most easily if when someone bought something, you handed them a dollar or you handed them two dollars to subsidize their parking rather than trying to shift it through us because they've paid in advance for their time and that machine isn't going to give it back and they're not going to come down here to get it from us, the city. And so the, the city the makes... The bid was very receptive to that. Okay. Uh, but you brought up a, a good point. Uh, was there any thought to the employees? I mean, are, are we doing is having more people parking on Balboa Island? Um, and taking the ferry over for a dollar as opposed to paying whatever, $15 or something for the day. Uh, I know that's an, an issue as far as also the Catalina Flyer and everything, um, that people park over there instead of paying. Um, right now, because the majority of the street parking is free, undoubtedly the employees who are arriving early are, are parking in the free street parking and taking in the commercial area that which ought to be for the customers of the business. So yes, this would be a radical change. And no, we have not talked extensively about employee parking other than employees ought to have been encouraged already by their employers to park in the lots rather than on the free street spaces. Well, I, I think that perhaps whether, uh, depending on, on the decisions that Sam give you a direction, but if there are funds particularly allocated to a certain area, that one of the things that would be um, important would be to identify employee parking. I know that's a big issue in Corona Del Mar, and I'm sure it's a big issue in the village as well, that we don't want, as you say, we don't want the, the employees taking the great parking so that the customers can't get in, but where do they park? So that we may have to identify and spend some money on something like that. We've, we've, I know we've talked about it in Corona Del Mar and wrestled with that issue. Okay. Um, as we continue to talk about revenues raised within the parking management district, the steering committee made it up of business members and homeowners associations in the Balboa Village area asked about the possibility of getting the parking fines, not just the meter revenues. And looking into that, those are not currently segregated or accounted for in any way and appear to currently go towards um, the police department or through the general fund. And so if you were to consider doing that, there would be a lot of bookkeeping that would be necessary um, in order to make that a functioning um, alternative. That to me is an easy one. 
<laughs> an easy uh, yes or an easy it's no? It's an easy no for me. Okay. <laughs> um, the, another question that came up was in the um, neighborhood enhancement. Um, in fiscal year 2009, um, the proposed Balboa Village Parking Management District generated about $973,000 in revenue to Tidelands and about $119,600 um, in revenue that was equally divided between the general fund and the neighborhood enhancement reserve for the entire peninsula because that's one unit at the moment. Um, with market pricing and the installation of 214 new meters, um, the district could generate using the highest rates in the 12 hour period. Um, $3,676,000 to the Tidelands and $1,573,000 um, for off-street parking and neighborhood enhancement um, based, as I said, on those higher rates. Lee, uh, th those seem like extraordinarily high numbers to me. Uh, you know, the, the lot rate, for example, is almost four times, um, although you're not talking about raising the actual per hour rate four times. And so <clears throat> I'm guessing you did a calculation that, that well, extrapolated um, the, in, the parking rate for the full availability of the space for the full time we would charge. No, how, no, how actually, did you do that? The, the 209 numbers are before the city's rate, raise of rate in April. Okay. So it's from the very lowest rate. And when I calculated what it might be, um, I calculated an average between meters and daily parking, and I calculated, I, I applied it for the three tiers, and then I applied the vacancy rate that Walker said occurred in each tier. So if there are, are 51 summer weekend days, um, it was 90% full for 51 days at the average of the lot and the daily rate. So I did my best to try and get an accurate number, but in part we're comparing the very old rates with with the maximum end of the new rate, and I and I have those numbers in a in a spreadsheet that I'd be happy to share. If we do a reduced daily rate, those would of course come down. Yeah. So well, if you could, I'd appreciate if you'd send me the spreadsheet just as a matter of curiosity. Okay. I'd, I'd like to see that. So, but yes, I did try and allow for vacancy and not 100% full and not 100 days. Um, at any rate, Walker recommended that revenues generated in the area, um, some of it come back to community businesses in exchange for the higher rates that their customers will be paying. And staff is proposing that the council create a new Belboa Village Neighborhood Enhancement Reserve for that purpose and to determine a percentage of the revenue to be allocated to that reserve as part of the annual budget process. And we are suggesting that at least initially that 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 percent might be 4%, which using those high numbers comes in at 62,369. Each 1% is about 15,700. And so um, the questions are, um, should we have a separate Belboa Village Neighborhood Enhancement Reserve? And should the, is the council supportive of transferring the Neighborhood Enhancement Reserve funds to the Balboa Village bid. Now, we were just noticing that to my great embarrassment that um, some minor wording changes like transferring the Neighborhood Enhancement Fund rather than saying delegating or something else didn't apparently make it into your um, agenda copies. We made a new copy after the last Tuesday agenda meeting and took it down, but it hasn't seemed to translate. Did you say that 50% uh, of the existing revenues are going into the neighborhood enhancement? Reserve? For the entire peninsula. And what we're talking about here is the newer funds going into a neighborhood enhancement for just the Elboa Village um, parking management district area. So why are you recommending 4% there when we're doing 50% elsewhere? Because we're looking at sending more funding into the off-street parking uh, management facilities because we have need to finish paying for the parking lot, for the at-grade parking lot, for the um, pay-by-space meters that would need to be instituted and should um, the, we reach an agreement with the non museum a parking structure. Yeah, so are we saying then that 50% goes into 
the general fund, 46% goes into building the parking facilities and 4% goes to the bid? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, the original proposal is that if the Balboa Parking Management District is created, it keep 100% of the funds generated within its area and 96% of those funds go into off-street parking and 4% go into neighborhood enhancement. There is a subsequent discussion item that I'll get to about budget impact where we raise a question as to whether or not some funds should be retained um, by, the, by the general fund. It's a bit apples and oranges. It's a little confusing the way we, you know, describe things with all these various funds and if there's some way to just sort of cut through all of that and simplify this fund structure that... <laughs> That, well, that's that, part of what we're trying to do with the questions we're asking since we have 41 different accounting pots going into three or four different places. And so we're looking to try and clean that up, which was not part of our original mandate, which is why we had some of these, these additional questions. Uh, as far as your neighborhood enhancement funds that are in the, that are there that I haven't been spent or earmarked, like for instance, I know that the, for a while the, the, uh, McFadden Square businessmen were extremely anxious to try to get some sort of parking program going there and had uh, at least what they thought was a fund being reserved and building up for their area. Is that there, fund still There were be there? in the code a couple of um, additional specific geographic areas and that, that were down here in Connery and McFadden. Those have expired. Um, they collected monies for a while and they did their projects and they have since expired. So as part of this code cleanup, we would take them out. Um, but we're talking about, about creating new funds. Um, in terms of where the money is most recently gone, as we talked about it, that which went into either neighborhood enhancement or off-street parking um, was scooped up by the council to purchase the um, former Balboa Market building and we're still in need of more funds to make the second and third payments. I, I guess I would appreciate it if we would just simply describe for the, Pal, for the parking benefit district for Balboa Village, we're gonna have a fund, 96% of it is gonna have to be used for off-street parking improvements in Balboa Village and 4%, if we agree, 4%, would go to neighborhood enhancement, if you will, with the governance structure associated with that. Just carve it out, make it simple, very straightforward yeah. for that area, and then we can figure out what to do with the rest of these, what we call the rest of these funds, and what, you know, yeah. you see what I mean? It, it would just make it a little simpler to right. understand. Right, and it's more confusing in this staff report because since we felt confident we were doing an off-street parking facilities fund, we're not talking about it at any great length. We we're focusing on the neighborhood um, enhancement reserve because there were the two questions there about percentage and about are you comfortable transferring those funds annually as part of the budget process to the Balboa Village bid. Yeah, and so uh, the other thing is the bulk of the money is goes to Tidelands because of the Tidelands controlled lots even in Balboa Village. You know, yes. So. That's, that's the biggest chunk. And that's the biggest chunk of the parking within the parking management district. Um, are, are there other questions you want to put up there? That's, yep, there they are. Okay, so we've got now to the residential parking permit question. Um, should the staff develop a residential parking permit program? Um, Walker suggested it. Um, I spelled out in the staff report the Walker style program, which frankly we think is very complicated and would be very difficult to administer. Um, staff suggested a simpler parking permit program where there would be a permit to allow you to park at meters um, without paying from 7 and 9, from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning and from 5 p.m. to 9 p to 7 p.m. in the evening, so two hours at each end. So if you didn't leave for work the crack of dawn or you got home from work a little earlier in the evening, um, you weren't paying for parking, and then after seven, um, parking is free again. Um, at the same time, when we were talking about this, it suddenly occurred to us that in those more residential streets, if we just didn't start the meters till nine and turn the meters off at five, um, you had the same impact without necessarily having to go to the Coastal Commission um, to get their permission to issue a parking permit. So we sort of have three variations, the Walker style program, a simplified permit program, or adjust the on-street meters in those areas that have a bit more residential. And 
lastly, in April, when the uh, Administrative Services Department raised parking rates, one of the things they did was to bring the parking rates in Balboa Village and Corona Del Mar into parity. Um, they hadn't previously been um, since our, um, where we're looking is simply the Balboa Village area. If we introduce the seasonal and market pricing, it will take these two areas out of parity and so an unintended consequence would be they would be different again. And so we thought we'd raise the issue of do you want them to be the same or different and should someone pick up adjusting Corona Del Mar if you want them to be the same. Can, can you go back to the last slide? If you uh, took the uh, adjusted st street hours 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., what impact would that have on the revenue projections? Do you have any feeling for that? Um, I haven't run those numbers yet. It, it would it would reduce it by uh, four hours for a certain portion of the meters. But we're talking about reducing it by four hours if we did a parking permit for the residents. Um, and I must admit, I don't have a good handle on how many people actually live year round within the parking management district. So it may be very few. Um, budget, this was your earlier question. Um, the administrative services department, based on the new meter, the new parking rates, um, assumed that this year's budget would uh, receive about $300,000 in revenue from the area that would be part of the Balboa Village Parking Management District. Um, and looking at the proposals for the parking management district, we were reluctant to suggest changing the prices um, before next May so that the current increase would have had a year to be in effect, people adjust a little bit, and that we would kick off the seasonal market pricing with the start of the peak season in 2011. So we're looking at suggesting that the new rates start May 20, 2011, and the funds not actually start collecting the monies until July 1, 2011, so that this year's budget is not impacted by what we're proposing to do. Um, that seemed to satisfy administrative services for this year, but they raised the broader question, we've been projecting budgets and revenues out till 2015, and this leaves us with a $300,000 hole in our budgets between yeah, now and, and 2015. Um, we'd prefer if you only took um, the increases beyond 300,000 rather than 100% which is what we've been proposing, that 100% of the revenues raised in the management district go back to the management district. So one of the options is, does that happen, or does the first 300,000 off the top, which has been included in the budgets from now through 2015, continue to go to the general fund? What was that 300,000 based on? Was that based on what they were collecting before, or some that's percentage based, of it? That's based on the new rates as of April. That's their projection. And our last question is, we've done quite a bit of public outreach. We had a kickoff meeting. Um, we had an advisory board of local businesses and HOA members um, in serving as a steering committee working on us. We presented regular progress reports to the Balboa Village bid. Um, we've had a previous study session. The Walker report's been on the website for a year. and. Is this adequate public outreach or before we come back with a program to implement, do you want us to talk to, to everybody again? And Nancy just brought up an issue of, of employee parking. So to summarize, and I don't have check marks to go on, yes or no. Well, uh, before we get there, I think Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Hinn has a couple questions for you. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, metering system that we're talking about for on-street parking. You're going to put in a pay station approach for the spaces that are currently non-metered. Yes. Are you intending to also replace the meter spindles for the spaces that are currently metered? Yes. Okay, so it'll be a, cons it'll be a system that's consistent throughout yes. for on-street parking. And then will this system include uh, credit card payment? Yes. And it will be programmable? Yes. But not Wi-Fi connected? I don't or know. We, we, we haven't gotten quite that far with, with public works yet, but we're, 
we're looking at having um, the most useful kind of, of pay by space okay. facility that we can. Um, if it's Wi-Fi connected, then you could read them back um, at the police station and actually when you send out a meter person, they could go directly to the spaces. If they're not Wi-Fi, the pay by space station, you can go to each individual station, two per block, and read out who has overstayed and then just go to those very specific spots. Okay. All righty. Well, uh, well, I think, uh, I think we should test the, the hypothesis that we've had good community outreach and invite the public to come up and make some comments at this point in time, and then we can take it back in and go through this list of questions and see if we have enough information to provide some guidance. So uh, I'd invite the public who have uh, comments on this to come forward. Through a three minute uh, comment period. Paul Louise. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, you may consider that you have had a lot of public well, Please state your name for the record, please. Oh, Louise Funnenberg, President of Central Newport Beach Community Association. Uh, I agree you may have had public input, but I am aware that there are many people on these streets that are full-time homeowners that have no idea there's going to be a meter system in front of their house. And we don't, we need to have more public input for those residents. Um, if it's in the back of the staff report or someplace else. I went through the staff report. It's a little hard for me to follow. But I recommend that you have more public input meetings with uh, bells and whistles to get those people out so that they know this is coming down. Because I personally, if I lived on Coronado or Fernando or any of those small streets down there, and all of a sudden there was a implementation of metered p parking that I was not aware of, I think I might come unglued. So I think we need to get that information out to the public. They don't care about the funds or where it goes, they care about what's parked in front of their house. And uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that you'll have more open meetings, especially with the residents. Thank you. Ralph. Good evening. Uh, Ralph Rodheim, my hat today is president of the Balboa Bid Association. Um, and there's a couple of areas. One, the merchants. Uh, we're all sitting here saying we're going to make these decisions. I'm representing a bunch of really small businesses that are really, really struggling or absolutely panicked about anything, uh, any parking increase. We're aware it's going to happen, so we hope that you at least stay to the Walker study and don't increase it beyond that. Uh, Balbo Island, as we know, has no uh, parking uh, meters. I think it should stay that way. It works. It's fine. Our fishing fleet down there says Dana Point has no parking fees, and so when people are deciding are we going fishing in Newport or Dana Point, that's a big decision maker. So our merchants are really, really, really concerned. Uh, put it in. I think the credit card will help. I think it's mandatory. Uh, see what happens, but let's monitor it so we can see what happens with the merchants. Also, the employees. Uh, all the businesses there have their employees. So how does that work? How do we work with that area? And we'd also, from the residential standpoint, like to encourage maybe residents are free for some time period as discussed, as discussed uh, to do something for the residents. Uh, this all sounds well, and to make the 300000 is fine, but if nobody comes there, uh, you're charging more, but you're having less people. And in the winter, if it was free parking, if we paid people to park, they still wouldn't be there in the winter months. So just be cognizant when you come up with your new numbers of do what you can to encourage uh, people to come and shop and promote and support the Village of Balboa. Uh, the merchants are really, really concerned. 
the merchants also don't care. They don't come to meetings. So it's up to a few of us to make decisions. So it's really on your shoulders to think about the small merchants in the village of Balboa and the residents, the employees, maybe some kind of validation system. Um, but that was the main concern to uh, really give some thought to the numbers you're doing. Try it, see what happens, but let's monitor it. Thank you. Ralph, I know that when we were doing our first presentations with, with Walker and they were talking about Pasadena and of course there was some reluctance there, but because the money was going back into the, that area to improve parking and other things, well, does that make a difference, do you think? It makes absolutely no difference to the small merchant. The merchant, and again, depends on which hat you want to wear, small merchant saying, I've got to see in business, I've got to figure a way to pay my lease now. And so if there is anything that negatively impacts it. Now I understand the Walker Report says there's more turnover, it's going to help your businesses. So again, we're going to try it. But uh, the merchants don't care. They, they'd like to, they don't care if there's a bid. You know, the merchants care about one thing, it's how do I keep my door open now, how do I drive business, how do I increase business. And it's important, we don't want a blighted community. We don't want some of the negative things coming in. So it's important that we, the City Fathers, really do what's best for those uh, small businesses. Thank you. WR Building, I reside within the bid. I've been there since 1965. Basically, just catty corner from the telephone building. I recall at that time, came before the Planning Commission to get conditional use permits to build my five duplexes, for which I only have one today. The thing that has disappointed me today is that you have not seen an overlay map of the bid itself. Because on this proposed boundaries, there are many, many residential units, both from basically from A to, to B Street, and then up uh, this back corner, up in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Uh, Councilman Han, I'm thrilled with the question you asked about the remote deal. I'm not gonna have a parking meter in, right in front of my house where somebody can tie up their bicycle. I think that was the biggest thing that we all picked up from this initially. I walked the area this morning asking people if they're aware. I heard one gentleman come off the hook, and I'm sure glad the Fair Political Practices Commission didn't hear his, his statement. But I, I think if there is an enhancement district funding, that it should include representation from the residential areas that are not in the current bid, because I know where I live and I walk down to the village, the closer I get to Main Street, the sidewalks are in worse condition with trash, gum, never clean. The homeowners don't bother to clean it. Another serious point that in my particular block, right next door to me, I have 11 grandfathered units, no parking. Behind that, there are nine units, no parking. There are umpteen activities in multifamily buildings now where the garages are not available for parking. I'm not, but having got worked with the, on the AD committee, for the underground district 101, to me over, I believe it's the 400 block of East Bay, the Harding Street area, there's the same problem. A lot of old places with no parking. The one thing that I notice in the late afternoons is the number of employees that come home or, or number of employees going to work that park in the area. See them with ruby uniforms on, walking to the other uh, establishments and whatnot. Uh, I'm happy to say with my tenants downstairs and myself, the three parking places that were required, that's all we need. The other four buildings have all been extra units, turned in a complaint, provide the city with the plans to go to court, it's been declared three units. But when you have a two bedroom unit today, we only require one parking place, but there are darn few of them that don't have two cars living out of them. Could I ask got a it? severe problem. 
I really enjoyed looking at this uh, presentation. I was thrilled to death to see Sharon Wood's name on there as a consultant. I have correspondence here from 1999 with her name on as assistant city attorney, but this has been the most effective. I think we need some local outreach within the areas particularly. Thank, thank you. Uh, I have I a, question. a question. You said that, that you see the employees, they're parking in the free street parking. Yes, ma'am. So that's one thing, Ralph, where I think it could make a difference because you're not going to have that long-term parking. You're going to have the customers there. At least that's Walker's theory, that, that you open up these things better for the – because you don't have just the free parking you're giving away. Thank yeah, you. But, Thank you. But with employee, if you charge the employees for parking, they're being, getting such low rates, that's going to be a substantial amount of money for them if they have to pay $12 a day for – well, I say I think that, we, that some, some program would have to be worked out. But that's, for the merchant at least, that's the thing we wrestle with in Crown Del Mar is the employees taking up that's all right. the, the good, good customer parking. Good afternoon. Um, hello, my name is Craig Batley, and I'm currently on the bid board of directors down there, and I've heard some of the comments lately from some of the businesses. And I've had the opportunity to live on the peninsula for some time and drive around into a lot of the areas and and I can just say that how much how, how much ever outreach you've had to date I would probably venture to say there's 75 80 percent of the people that are going to be affected especially the, the residences that are going to have to be paying for parking in front of their house have no idea this is even happening and this has been going on for a long time and I think it probably would be if you had all the people that are going to be affected in this uh, in this auditorium here You'd, you'd see a lot. You'd hear probably a lot of negative impact. Of course, they don't understand the the reasons for all this and the Walker study and, and the ramifications of the more sophisticated parking program, uh, which I think probably has a lot of good elements. But when you start looking at even this handout here, and you look at the streets and the and the the way they're listed in here, the average person doesn't have an, uh, not even close to an idea that their residential place is going to be affected. And I really think that probably it, it would be a good idea to have a little bit more public outreach, however, even if it was just one or two meetings, and make it really publicized and get some more people here to get a little more input and maybe explain the program a bit more. I concur with all the previous comments. Thank you. Mark Carlazzi, uh, 115 East Bay. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I have no idea why we're even considering this. You have to ask yourself what's going on here. Uh, this city exists for one reason only, and that is to protect its residents and to serve its residents. And yet we have here a proposal that is nothing more than a kick in the face to the residents. I've talked to the residents that live in, that, that will be affected by this, and it's not just the residents that are actually in the bid. It's residents that are close to that area because what's going to happen is you're going to shift all the parking from these meters. Those people aren't going to pay $1,000 a year to park in front of the meters. They're going to move, and they're going to move further down Bay Avenue. So it's not just a localized problem. It's the whole area that's going to be affected. We've got a situation where these residents do not know what's going on. This has not been publicized. I've talked to people. They have no clue. I thought there'd be a riot here when I heard about this. And I'm amazed that the city council is even taking this up. If, if I was on the council right now and this proposal came to me, I'd throw it in the trash and say try again. Because who does it benefit? Is this city's function to collect money to do, uh, is it as a pro for profit enterprise or is it an enterprise to serve and, and protect its citizens? Because if it's the latter, it's not doing it. Because when you take and you put parking meters in front of people's houses, you destroy their property values. Would any of you council persons like to have a parking meter in front of your house? I don't think so. So why should other persons in this city have parking meters in front of their houses? Are there other residential districts in this city where there's parking meters in front of people's houses? Have you considered the legal impact of that? Is that been considered by legal counsel as whether that would be equal protection of the law to have different parts of the city treated differently? Uh, is the Coastal Commission going to approve of this? The bigger issue is why are we doing this? Why aren't we helping the residents? Why are we trying to hurt them? That's the question I have for the council. Is the city so desperate for money that it has to do this 
what I consider an egregious abuse of the existing resident base down there. There's so few residents down there that are here. We have an auditorium and you look around and they should all be here, but they don't know. I've talked to a few people and they think I'm crazy, even telling them that the city is proposing this. We don't know about it. But yet, we've got it pretty far along here and I haven't heard a single comment out of this council questioning the wisdom of this whole thing. I've heard questions about the details, well, where's the $500, you know, where's the percentage is gonna go, but I have not heard a single question, why are we doing this? Why are we hurting our residents? If we wanna do permit parking, here's what we should do. We should make the whole area permit parking only. Put up big blue signs. Charge the residents a reasonable fee. Let's protect the residents from the out of town people, from Riverside, from all the other areas that come to this city and use our services that they don't pay for, leave trash all over, throw gum on our streets, make our areas filthy. Can I extend? Uh, no, we don't extend. Thank you. Your comments were to the point. Next speaker, please. Mr. Mayor, Council, my name is Jim Stratton. I uh, live at 315 Alvarado Place. Uh, I'm not within the uh, affected area. Uh, I'd like to compliment the staff uh, for an exemplary job in attempting to deal with a very difficult and complex problem. It's obvious that much time has gone into this uh, study. Uh, there's an area of the report I'd like to address uh, that involves adding to the number of on-street meters and parking management district and increasing the rates charged. The increase in the number of fee-based spaces in Balboa Village while potentially increasing city revenues will also increase the lack of availability of free parking in other areas. Uh, the added increase in parking fee rates will only compound this impact on adjacent free parking areas. Simply put, people will just walk three more blocks and park in a uh, free parking place. Uh, you're, you're not solving a problem here. Um, on page 11 of the Balboa Village parking study, it was noted that uh, Walker parking, parking suggested a residential parking permit program inside the parking uh, management district and or immediately adjacent to the PMD. It is, I believe, an excessive and complex fee-based permit program that is totally unfair to residents and in the PMD. The precedent for free access to nearby street parking by owners and residents has been established in most cities and communities in the United States. Residents are already paying for this parking indirectly through city and local taxes and fees. I mean, everybody has parking in front of their house. Um, I would note the city already has uh, ad address restricted parking on one of its streets, Medina Way, between Edgewater and East Bay. There are some people that have their own little private parking spaces on Medina. Did you know that? Well, they do. You get a ticket if you park there. The staff has suggested an alternative to the parking permit, i.e. Nine, 9 to 5 meters. Um, that, while simpler, may not have much positive impact on residents in the parking management district. For example, what about people who don't work or that don't work from 9 to 5? Maybe they're on their swing shift or they only work part-time. The solutions pros proposed for our owner residents within the PMD are unfair and not in keeping with precedent. The staff also has not address the impact of increased fee-based parking and increased parking rates on existing free parking in areas adjacent to the PMD. And I think that's an important issue. I encourage the staff to reconsider nominal, and I emphasize nominal resident permit parking in free parking areas surrounding uh, uh, areas that are highly used by non-residents. I've made a proposal in thank, this thank, regard. Thank you, sir, your time's expired. And uh, we'll be glad to share it with the staff. Thank and you. I'd also like to say that Pasadena, Santa Monica, and Los Angeles all have permit parking for people in high impact areas. Thank you, sir. Any other speakers? All right, seeing now, let me bring this back to the council for discussion. 
Mayor Curry, can I make a brief comment sure. as you do? I, I, I do think, at least from the city staff's perspective, that this is a lot to digest. Um, I, I don't expect you to go through a checklist like this, especially uh, at, at 10 minutes to 6. Um, I'm going to propose something without having spoken before to the Mayor Pro Tem that maybe if you're interested in offering your strong feelings on any aspect of this, including outreach, which I think is obvious we need to do more on, um, please do offer that now. Um, what you don't have the benefit of, too, here is a staff recommendation on, on some of these um, suggestions, including things that affect the general fund. So I was able to sit and learn more about this with as well, and I see some benefit there, but I, I'd have my own staff recommendations for, for you on some of those items. And then I think um, we would like to, I, I would recommend that we do return this to you after the outreach with some additional staff recommendations. Yeah, I guess building on your comments for a moment, Dave, I, um, we definitely do need more public outreach in my view. I think the public outreach ought to be conducted, though, with a straw man out there for people to look at. So we ought to have enough input from council here today that we can have a construct of how things might work that we can then discuss in the public outreach before we come back here for action on anything. It's, it's clear that the public outreach that we've had has been mostly to do with the Walker parking reports, not the public at large. And there is a number of residents that will be affected by this. I'd like to get a better feeling for how many residents, a, a rough estimate at least, of how many residents would be affected by the metering of currently unmetered spaces as a start anyway. And so maybe can we go through this checklist and, and at least get some initial feeling of council? Do you feel like we have yeah, I, I just um, I would object to that. I think we really need more public uh, outreach. I think consolidating funds sounds very tidy, but I mean, I think it's quite clear that the residents have really not been consulted, and I'd like to hear their input. Well, but the problem is I don't want to just throw it out there without any sort of structure associated with it because then it's hard for anybody to have an intelligent conversation on it. So, Yeah, but these questions aren't going to answer what the residents' questions are. I, mean. I, I think a real difference here, too, is that, I had, and I hadn't thought about it until uh, there were some comments here, is that in Crone Del Mar, although we're not as far along, it was resident-generated. It was residents asking us to do something. And here was more, I guess, from the... the Business. commercial perspective, which uh, perhaps was the, the, the tail that was wagging the dog. Or, I mean, they're both parts of the dog, but, but that was a big difference, and I hadn't really considered the difference in the two districts. Yeah, I, I, if I may interject, I, I would also agree. I mean, I, you know, some of these questions I could probably give you my gut reaction to, but overall I think we probably do need more resident input and I do want staff recommendations actually I was kind of surprised that these things have been thrown out here to us without a recommendation so and I, and I would add to that I mean I'd have nowhere to begin to answer these questions because uh, I don't know how much we're to, you know are we diverting money from the general fund if so how much what's the trend on that what's the impact to a resident in terms of you know on an annual basis of what he would have to pay to park I don't know maybe we don't know I mean we're really not ready for prime time with this and all of those questions sort of need to be fleshed out, the impact on the businesses, how employee parking is going to work. Uh, you know, it, I, I have a sense during the whole presentation of like when you're at the ball game, you're, you're playing the game where you follow the dot that's underneath the, the batting helmets and trying to figure out where it is. And you can't really follow the money properly and you can't really follow the impacts right. on the neighborhoods or the, or the residences properly. So I think we, and, I, and it's pretty clear we need some more feedback, particularly from residences in the neighborhood. So let's. Send it back and send it. Well, but then let me suggest an alternative, and that is that, you know, it's my district. I'd be happy to work with staff to put together a, an outreach program that we would work with. And, you know, it'll, it'll, we'll have to have some sort of a construct here to discuss with people. I think I've got a fairly good feeling for the whole situation here, and obviously it wouldn't come with the imprimatur of council here but i think i can probably do a reasonable job structuring something that could be discussed with the residents before it comes back to council for i think i'm fine with is that, are you guys comfortable with that i guess as long as it's not too well developed or we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves i would like to see when you do come back like a table or a matrix here so we can actually see this and see i mean even just the names of the funds and all that 
it gets a little confusing if you're trying to follow it. So I think we need. And little, yeah, I mean, I'd like the presentation to, I'd like to wasn't bad. I'm just saying that I'd like to see it all laid out 50% here, 46% there. What does it mean to, it, what is neighborhood enhancement? I don't know. I mean, you know, is that we're going to, you know, paint things and landscape and stuff, or does that mean something else? What kind of capital improvements? I know some were listed, but I'd like to see it in a more, I guess, concise but laid out format. Um, as far as some kind of clear input, um, I would say with those businesses to try to um, increase exemptions and address, you know, issues where employees could be impacted as well as the business owners. So I'd, I'd just like to see us not um, to sort of be mindful that the small businesses are really struggling. And although we're trying to increase their revenues, let's not sort of put them out of business while doing so. Well, and I think the issue of diversion from uh, either people parking on Belleville Island or parking in, at Peninsula Point or parking further up the peninsula and how that behavior will be modified by paid parking in a specific location also needs to be part of the strategy that we come back with. And as far as I'm concerned, if I, one of the things that I would be looking at under residential parking permits is, is and it was brought up earlier by there's a number of units with no parking. Should they be given the same price permit as somebody that does have parking? And how do we create this program or the uh, resident parking program that will encourage people that have parking but are using it for storage to clean the storage out so they can use the parking? The age old question. Why do you get quite a task ahead of you here? Well, that's what I signed up for. So and I think I can I think I can come back with something that addresses a number of these issues this whole this whole mayor's nest of parking reserve funds we just need a simple construct of all of that I think and you know we can come back with budget numbers etc to help try and straighten that out too so I'd be happy to do that Dave I'll certainly in, uh, ask for your help on that, but uh, hopefully staff will be driving the major I, workload there. I, I guess I guess uh, I would make one further comment to the point of the resident that said, you know, this is ridiculous. It's not helping anything for anybody. Well, the fact that we have Balboa Village decaying every day in front of us is not helping the residents either. That is a problem that we have to solve. That problem can only be solved if we have functional parking solutions to support the businesses and a mechanism by which the property owners in the village can see their way clear to a path to revitalize their properties, reinvest and revitalize their properties. We have no choice, in my view, but to find a solution here. And we need to be sensitive to the residents, that's for sure and we'll do some more output, and I'm sure we will find a solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is public comments. Does anyone in the public wish to comment on a matter not on the agenda? Please come forward. All right, seeing none, we are adjourned until uh, council meeting at seven o'clock. Did anyone leave their glasses up here at the podium? Just, no, okay.